Greetings, this is the Questing GM. I hope I am live now. Uh, this is going to be a first in a hopefully series of videos that I've been wanting to do actually for quite a while. Uh, so this is partly a test video as well as the pilot episode, uh, you could say, of doing this sort of videos uh, on a stream. And all right, so basically what is this uh, hopefully series of videos that I'm planning to make? Uh, this is basically called the RPG study hour where I basically go on stream to read read and learn a new RPG system or even maybe even a previously learned RPG system uh, and you know it's just a live it's just a live read aloud basically uh, and there's probably going to be uh, as, I'm, as I'm learning the system I'm probably going to have some reactions to how things are written uh, to some trying to trying to connect the dots as I'm reading through the mechanics, trying to understand the mechanics. Uh, and part of the reason why I'm doing this is not, number one is not only just to uh, facilitate a bit of my learning, as well as hopefully, you know, wh whatever experience I've gone through and I've learned is helpful for someone else who's, go who's about to go through the same process. The purpose of this RPG study hour uh, is basically dedicating one hour of live stream trying to finish up reading on a particular on a particular section of the uh, rules of something so the adventure they have chosen uh, the rules they have chosen for this first session this pilot episode is star trek adventures the role playing game uh, but not the full game it's just a quick start guide as you can see hopefully on my uh, on my screen right now on my pdf reader uh, now the reason why i pick uh, star trek or this this Star Trek Adventures, uh, is because I'm I'm not it's not because I'm a I'm not a particular Trekkie. Uh, the only Star Trek that I was exposed to during my childhood was uh, I believe the first generation. I can't believe I, I believe so. The one with uh, John Luke Picard, and even then I was too young to understand exactly what were the signs you know uh, being talked about. So I've never really been a Trekkie. In, in, in my life uh, and that's not the reason why I chose Star Trek Adventures the real reason why I chose Star Trek Adventures by Modipus uh, is because it is using a s engine called the 2D20 system uh, and this was a, this one confusion that I had when I made about, the, about Star Trek Adventures and compared with many of other Modipus systems who is also famous for making uh, Mutant Year Zero Tears from the Loop uh, is that these are two uh, the two d twenty system is a distinct system from what is used in the mutant year zero uh, system which i believe it's, i believe it's called the zero engine if i'm not mistaken so i i never i f didn't realize they were actually two different systems until i've been hearing a lot about it and I'm and people are telling me this is a two d twenty system and they were introducing some mechanics that i've never heard of when i when i played uh, mutant year zero and Tears from the loop and so I dug in a little bit deeper and only to realize, all right, there is something different about 2T20 and what's being used in the Zero Engine. So my real purpose is actually to get into uh, 2T20 system. Uh, and there's actually quite a number of 2T20 systems games out there besides Star Trek. Uh, there's, an, there's another, fanta they, have, they have a fantasy counterpart, I believe, which is called Symborium. And I think it's also the system that runs a John Carter as well as Conan and I'm probably missing I'm not sure I think I think Alien Core the Alien RPG the, the recent one at least also uses the 2D20 system if I'm not mistaken but don't quote me on that uh, but out of all that selection why did I chose Star Trek Adventures number one I think because Star Trek Adventures Star Trek as a franchise and itself as a property by itself is actually a more accessible uh, franchise to get into uh, if I'm planning to run this in the future for uh, public games or even with my group. So I, fig I, figured, that, I figured that if they're going to use the same base engine, uh, it might, let's try to mi minimize distractions from introducing the setting and the lore of the, of, of the game, of the, set, of the setting that comes with the 2D20 system. So I figured Star Trek Adventures is probably the, the easiest one to go with in terms of... Uh, uh, not needing to really understand a whole lot about the Star Trek universe uh, but at the same time being able to take a deeper look under the hood for its 2D20 system. So 
so as I as I plan, uh, this is it's it's a very short quick start guide. It's only about thirty three pages, as you can see on the top on the top here. It's only about thirty three pages, uh, and why and why did I decide to go with the quick start guide rather than just the full rules by itself? Obviously, the quick start guide is shorter, and I I wanted to see how the quick start introduces the two D twenty system. Uh, by, by using the quick start guide as some sort of gateway document for anyone who wants to learn the, the system and the game. I, I am planning to run the, this quick start for public games uh, and therefore I don't want to you know throw uh, entire entire rule book uh, at somebody to tell them to learn the game before they come to the game itself. So this is this is part as an introductory for myself as a, as a potential GM and also as a good a good introduction and gateway for anyone who wants to get into uh, Star Trek as well as uh, Star Trek Adventures as well as the 220 system as a whole. So for the purpose of, of this first uh, episode, you could say for this video and this video series on Star Trek Adventures Quick Start, uh, I will be just going through some of the basic introductions uh, and maybe some of the and try to do a breakdown of uh, how I'm planning to go through this entire quick start guide in the in the following videos that to come. Uh, so this may be a relatively short video, or this may be a relatively long video, depending how much ground we cover uh, tonight. Uh, oh, but my my guideline is always trying to keep it to keep everything within us within an hour, and you know so that it's 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 short enough for you to digest any information that's been given not too long for you to, for it to be a drag and I'm trying to find a good cutting point in the sense that uh, you can you can watch these videos in chunks or just in, in a particular a particular video that deals with a particular section of the rules to help with your understanding uh, and also to obviously to help with mine just in case I need to reference back any old uh, any old parts of the rules that I may have forgotten or may need some revisions before I start running uh, running the game so Star Trek so Hopefully, you can see right here, Star Trek Adventures, uh, the role-playing game, quick start guide. So let's get on with it and let's see what we have installed. Okay, uh, just a quick note, I think uh, this this quick start guide, I believe, is available for free from either Modipus uh, website or drive through RPG. Alright, so Star Trek Adventures, let's go. Alright, so the first page we have here is credits. Uh, and this is actually one uh, area of the uh, one page that I particularly like to go through you go through first uh, before I actually crack open uh, in getting into the rules of uh, the ne the nitty gritty stuff. Um, particularly because I think you know up creating RPGs uh, is actually very 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 difficult work, and it may be harder than most people think. So it's really nice to really try to appreciate the people and know the people know the people behind behind these RPG systems and maybe there be a, there might be a few surprises here and there uh, if maybe someone you didn't realize who was working or something that you knew is working on the same piece of work that you're working now so system design is by Nathan Dowdle now this is uh, obviously this is my first uh, 2d20 system I've never read anything prior to Star Trek Avengers so uh, Nathan Dodo is, Dodo is going to be a name that I'm going to, I'm trying to, I'm going to try to remember when I'm reading future uh, different two D twenty systems because it's uh, system design. Uh, line development is by David Chap and Sam Webb. Writing by Nathan Dodo, Ian Lemke, and Sam Webb. So and then we have uh, Canon editing by Scott Pearson. So Canon editing sounds to me like they've actually had a consultant from the Star Trek universe. Uh, I don't exactly know who would be the custodian of the property right now, uh, but it's interesting that if there is, if Canon Editing is really who I is doing the job that I think he is, then that's, a, that's actually kind of uh, interesting to know that uh, they they not only have the license to make the Star Trek game, but also it, they also have to pass the manuscript to uh, someone who is to, to, to the custodians to actually. Uh, may either fact check or maybe try to clarify some of the some of the canon lore that is in the in the setting in itself. 
So at least they, they may be the additional step that we may not be realizing. Uh, cover up, cover artwork by Guillem Pogilupi and Joseph Diaz. Now I, I've noticed, I think this is not my first uh, Modipus Entertainment quick start. I just kind of recall when was the last time I read one. But I've noticed that some, most of these artworks are actually done by some sort of, you know, I won't like, to, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure if they are like American, but I noticed that there's a lot more foreign names when it comes to artwork uh, compared to your standard, you know, uh, American, Saxony sort of names. All right. So internal artwork, we have quite a, quite a long list. Martin Sober, Sob Sober, uh, Stephen St Steve Stark, Connor McGill, Elaine Rivard, Rodrigo Toledo, Christy Balenescu, Joseph Diaz, and Nick Greenwood. So there's a few. What there's a there's one or two familiar names here, uh, namely Joseph Diaz, who is also in some way, uh, part of the artwork team. Uh, art direction is by Sam Webb. Uh, graphic design by Matthew Matthew Corbin. Layout by Richard L. Gale. So layout is actually one thing I think a lot of people take for granted in in creating RPG books. I think uh, because layout can be really really important because uh, RPG books is in my belief uh, is not meant to be read. It's meant to be referenced. So how you organize information to be found in different in, in a certain way really makes a huge difference. I think uh, and really deserves a lot more attention than it's given. And you know, uh, the thing is, even a great RPG system can be brought down by very, di very disgusting layouts. You know, if the layouts are very difficult to to produce, then I, I, I personally think that's a failure of 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 the of, of the book in itself. Uh, and I rather use a well laid out system than a well made system in my mind. Alright, so produced by Chris Birch, publishing assistant is Salwa Azar. And we have operations manager Gary Harper, production manager Steve Jaldry, community support Lloyd Lloyd Gion. With thanks to Dream Rodenberry, John V. Citus, Marion Colby, Veronica Hart, Keith Lone Dayton War, and Scott Pearson. Uh, play testers. Now this is actually a very interesting one. Uh, play testers, the cruise of the USS Lexington, USS Venture. USS Thunder Child and USS Bellerophon. Now, I'm not a Trekkie fan, obviously, so I, I, uh, I'm not exactly sure if if any of these ship names are, you know, they actually have a, their, their own shows uh, on television. Uh, do they have? Are they? Are they? These are, are these recognize, recognizable names from the Trekkie universe? Uh, I believe it's USS Lexington sounds familiar, but uh, I've never heard of the others, so I'm not exactly sure. Uh, who exactly these play testers are? Are they like the cast of uh, who 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 appeared in those on those uh, television series, or is just trying to make a uh, anonymous names, but you know, giving them a giving them a giving calling them the crew of such and such. Okay, so that's page one. Let's go into credits. Uh, okay, so this, uh, I guess there's some information here. So Multiples Entertainment, uh, 2D20. All right, so the 2D20 system and Multiples awards are copyright on Multiples Entertainment. All D20's text is copyright Multiples Entertainment. So this is a basically copyright information. Artwork and graphics and CBS Studios all rights reserved except for Multiples. So I think CBS Studios is the one who's currently holding the uh, property license, the, prop the IP for Star Trek. So I'm guessing that means that everything has to go has to be you know go through CBS Studios uh, approval to be published. All right. So moving on into page two. So page two we have Star Trek Adventures assembled the away team. These are this is uh, these are advertisements I believe for miniatures. Uh, not exactly sure if I would, I would be interested in any in getting of these. The next generation. We have miniatures from the next generation crew and the miniatures from the original series, which I believe from the nineteen sixties. Uh, we have a Klingon, Klingon band, more band, and we have Romulan strike teams. Uh, and we your eight thirty two millimeter high high quality racing miniatures. So these are pretty much the standard stuff. 
uh, there's a whole wow they actually have a whole catalog of uh, miniatures that are provided all right moving on we have star trek adventures a full range of books and accessories uh, wow so let's have a look so these are the luxury items uh, luxury sets of the entire i'm guessing probably the entire star trek collection at the moment uh, looks neat but like i said these are these are luxury items i not definitely i'm definitely not within the market uh, capable of getting some of these uh, although the interesting part is i guess it comes with the miniatures which is probably which is probably worth it in some sense and there's a core robot i can see here and there's this interesting star map that's probably going to be useful uh, if you're going to run some sort of long-term campaign with it so I'm not sure is this what the whole thing comes with. There's quite a lot of things actually if, it, if that's what comes with it. Uh, limited edition core book. So there's like one, two, uh, ball, game master, comma operations, dice sets, miniatures, deck tiles. And we have uh, two core books. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven other books that comes with it, which I don't see them here. Probably somewhere in this this bunch, this box, this little shelf here. But I'm not exactly sure what's entailed within the command division and science and all this. So yeah, so these are the Voyagers Mission Volume One, which I'm not sure is it, is, is this supposed to be a published adventure or is this supposed going to be uh, what you call that fictional uh, fictional media basically, uh, just novels or some or short stories of some kind that supplements with what you're running all right so okay so we have quick start rules so this is actually sort of the point where i decide where i take a bit of a pause and uh halt things a little bit because uh before we get into reading the actual stuff we need to understand what's within what's found within uh the quick start rules in itself and therefore we have so i, I typically try to do a breakdown of that and then i try to uh plan ahead of into where my cutting points should be in my understanding of things so it seems that things seems to be really really simple there's an introduction uh, page up to page six and, and we have basic operation uh, basic operations up to page eight which is about so there's only about two pages of introductions uh, basic operations at page eight and then conflict starts at page 13 so that takes about, about five pages and i think that's about it so that's what we see on the page however if we go onto the bookmarks that's available in the uh, PDF in itself, you would see here this this how this is basically the breakdown of that. So basically, I would say there are three main sections of the rules, the quick start rules itself. Obviously, there's the introductions, uh, and then followed by basic operations, and then we have conflict, and then the subsequent part would be the away mission, which I'm guessing is the pre generated adventure that comes with the quick start and then lastly is the pre-gen player characters okay so that's basically one two three four five uh i typically don't do i, I typically won't be reading uh won't be including the the pre 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 adventure along inside this rpg up rpg study hour series because i think that's something I, I, it needs to be read and prepped and uh, definitely done behind closed closed doors so that it won't uh, ruin the surprise or anyone who's watching it uh, but that, then again that's something that you know if anyone decide thinks that it's worth the time to actually read it as part of the learning process then let me know uh, but at this point at this point in time my intention is not to include the pre adventure the adventures inside inside the series of the RPT study hour so we can basically skip that entire section on itself. Uh, Pre-gen is also another one that I also I don't really have good reasons to include, but uh, I o I usually include I usually dip into you know going through the uh, pre-gens when I'm doing my study of our characters, which is part of the basic operations. So I think basic operations is basically the the core rules, the the engine, the underlying. Uh, core mechanic uh, of the game itself and then I'm guessing conflict here based on the headers I'm given here it looks like it's the combat rules so uh, basic operations and conflict although they may seem uh, interlaced but I think it's safe to 
consider them as their own distinct set of uh, systems or subsystems within a larger system. So I would definitely not be mixing basic operations together with conflict, I think, most likely. Uh, and then introductions. So I think uh, for tonight, uh, for this first uh, RPG study session, I think I will be we just going through the introductions uh, just to get a just to get a hang of what is exactly that this what sort uh, what sort of expectations I should have with going forward into trying to understand Star Trek Adventures and maybe try to maybe you know try to catch some keywords and also maybe try to catch a bit of some of the, the intentions uh, of the system in what it's trying to portray and also at the same at, at, by doing so. Uh, discarding some of any any kind of uh, wild expectations that I may have about what I think the system is going to do, but you know if if it explicitly states the other the in other words, then that's fair to uh, set expectations by knowing what this system is about. And this is something I think uh, uh you know some people don't like to do. They don't like to read the introductions parts, the preface. Uh, when they are flipping open of uh, rules and they want to get right down to learning the rules in itself, which I think can be a bit dangerous in the sense that it, uh, when you do not read the introductions, you you enter learning the rules with your own expectations, and when those expectations do not match up when you're learning the rules and you don't know why the rules are written in such a way, then <clears throat> there is some sort of negative connotations or impressions about the rules in itself, <clears throat> or there may be some sort of misunderstanding about the rules of why they're why they're operating in such and you don't and it may cause you know some uh, dissatisfied or unhappy experiences of using the rules when you're not understanding why they're written why why they're written in such a way or where is where is the rule coming from or what is it trying to uh, emulate through the rules after understanding the, its intentions so so just trying to uh, before I get right into the introductions, I think just to hash out a little bit more. Uh, so it seems to me that I can do introductions tonight. Hopefully, I can finish the introductions of tonight. Now, going into basic operations, if you look at the bookmark, uh, they have characters, task, improving the odds, difficulty zero task, which is down here, and then we have examples of use of momentum. These are the sidebars and threats. So Difficulty zero task and examples are sidebar. Which can, I think we can ignore those. Uh, I think the one that I need to pay attention to is improving his characters, which is his own, you know, his, his own list here. You can, as you can see, it has like three sub subsections under characters. Under task, we have one, uh, two, three, four, five. About about five subsections under task. Uh, improving the odds has a uh, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, improving the odds has uh, one, two, three. More subsection under improving the odds. I think that should be about it. That's, no, it's, I think there's a lot more to it. Yeah. So really, so improving the odds actually seems to be a quite a quite a hefty section by itself. And then we have threats. So threats we have also quite a quite a bit to go on and that's about, it takes about half a page more than half a page to get through uh, so I'm not sure if I can I will be able to fit to fit exactly everything within uh, basic operations into one video I may have to break this down into into two separate videos or do one video for each of the sections and, and their subsections like characters will take its own uh, take, I can do one video just on characters and then it, uh, this may seem very short, but once I had to dip into re uh, comparing it with the pregens, then it might take a lot, take a lot longer to understand to understand exactly what's uh, going on. So I'm thinking right now I may make characters uh, the character section uh, its own video because I'll be jumping between the character rules here with the pregens, uh, and then second the next video I think on task. Uh, which takes up about one, two, three, three pages. Uh, three pages seems pretty short, but I would have to say, I think, 
Yeah, it seems pretty short, but I have a feeling that this is going to be one of the most important uh, part of the rules. So uh, maybe may a lot of uh, brain power that needs that, that needs to, that, that's going to be needed to digest, understand a lot of things. And I have a feeling that task and improving the odds are related to each other. So I think the ideal would be to try to squeeze task and improving the odds into its into the same video so that you can see where the connections are needed to each other. But as a result of that, it may be a much longer video than what's gonna, uh, uh, than what the character's video is going to be like. And then I think lastly, I will be separating threads into its own videos to, to finish up uh, on the basic operations uh, section. Uh, b uh, section, yeah, basic operations section. And then after that, moving on, we will go into conflict, the conflict sections. Uh, chapter if you want to call it uh, we have encounters we have conflict actions and, and under conflict actions we have so under encounters we have about two sections here and then conflict actions we have one one two so that's two sec two subsection under conflict actions and then under attacks and damage uh, we have another one and then we have combat momentum spent and then types of attacks so okay, so how am I going to split up? So basically, conflict. I would say it's the it's basically the combat rules, the combat rules of the system. Uh, so I guess you could say encounters really is its own thing. Uh, I don't think it's. Uh, I think it's this is the, the encounter section here is just a general setup of how to set conflict encounters, uh, what what they are and how they work. And then the the but the nuts and bolts will be actually the under the conflicts actions, which it takes about about one to uh, about two pages. So that's not very long, uh, but it's an op it's an option thing. So and I think in, it only works better in the context of understanding encounters. I might be wrong. I'm just guess. I'm just basing this off you know from a glance view. This is not a full read on yet. So. I may uh, plant encounters and conflict actions into 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 its the same video because I think they require same they require a, a shared understanding. Uh, then we come into attacks and damage, which I believe is you know how attacks and damage are resolved in this game, and I think that will have to be joined together with the type of attacks. Now I'm not exactly sure what combat momentum is. Let's let's see if we can take a quick look. Into it to see anything. So, the key resource during combat, in fact, you mentioned this thing, options that also come. Table below provides options. So, it, this this actually feels to me like this actually belongs together with conflict actions. You know, from a first glance. I'm, I'm not exactly sure if, that, if that's the right way to go about it. They talk, uh, talk about a mechanic called momentum, I believe. Yeah, momentum. So without without knowing what momentum is, uh, I think it's quite difficult to make a call. But I think this is something to do with actions, and just from a glance, it actually seems it, it this is this would seem very familiar with uh, Dragon Age, uh, the Age system, the stun system from the Age the Age series of games, Dragon Age, Fantasy Age, Modern Age, uh, the Expanse. Uh, so I have a feeling that this is something to do with when you're making attacks and when you're spending a momentum of some kind uh, and you get to do additional things with it. So I guess that's fair to put it on the attacks and damage. So I think what I'll do here is, uh, so because yeah, that's because it's under combat, uh, because combat momentum spends are under attack and damage, it's after attacks and damage. And obviously types of types of attack I believe has, has everything to do with, you know, it's, it's part of a subsection of the attack and damage rules. So I think what I'll do for the conflict section is I'll split it into two. Uh, I will deal. I will. I will talk. I will squeeze encounters and conflict and uh, conflict actions into the same video, and then I will do a separate video on attacks, damage, uh, combat, combat spend, and types of attack into the into its same video. So that should be about it. So let's see if I. I should have written all this thing down to uh, my plans. Let me just just give me a few minutes to put this all down on paper and 
so they can have a much better much larger view of uh, what is it exactly that I'm dealing with and how long this whole thing is gonna take so that's that's about six videos worth into the entire series uh, <coughs> which means it's either about six weeks in length or I can actually squeeze it up and finish it all in a week if it's possible uh, also as I, as I mentioned uh, you know for the pregens uh, I will definitely be also covering part carving uh, bits and pieces of the pregen as I'm doing the characters chapter so that pretty much sums up the entire uh, learning plan or process for the Star Trek Avengers quick start guide so six six videos I don't think it's too difficult it's not too uh, it's it's a little bit a bit long for my taste uh, for something so short but I think it's more beneficial if you know it's it I, I'm trying to I'm trying to have it uh, better curated rather than trying to make trying to be a efficient uh, with my time in making these videos so I guess now it's uh, oh it's wow it's already more than half an hour and uh, I've, I've barely got about 15, 15 to half an hour left just to do the rest of this video so I guess let's not waste too much time and let's try to get us to get into the introduction section of the rules all right so quick start rules introduction to explore strange new worlds to seek out new life and new civilization to boldly go where no one has gone before quote by captain john lucard from the next generation welcome to the final frontier you are about to embark as a starfleet officer on a federation starship headed for the unknown to boldly go where no one has gone before as a starfleet officer you are among the best and brightest in, fed in the federation Commanders, pilots, scientists, engineers, and doctors. Your starship, a vessel of great speed and power, is the pinnacle of space exploration technology, allowing you and your crew to investigate new spatial anomalies and support Federation worlds through the galaxy. So you are assumed to be the best and brightest in the Federation, uh, in whatever capacity that you're serving as. Star Trek takes place in a future where humans, in which humans have formed an alliance with hundreds of other worlds to support one another and explore the galaxy, pushing the boundaries of both known space and knowledge. Scarcity of resources is no longer an issue. That's a very interesting assumption, and I think this was something I, I, I do remember uh, seeing in at least, I think, one of the first few episodes of uh, Next Generation, that the hum uh, human technology has evolved into a point where there is, no, there is no limits in terms of economical or industrial limitations that forces humanity to explore uh, space uh, or the universe in this in, in this case uh, it's more of a pursuit of knowledge rather than a pursuit for a solution to a problem that is happening somewhere else all right applicators synthesize meals and equipment so that's interesting so that's one assumption I think it's worth noting that scarcity of resources is no longer an issue all right. people of all worlds travel faster than light between systems at warp causing whole sectors of space in days or weeks Away teams are teleported instantly to the surface of a planet or between spaceships. Energy weapons are used by both security personnel and starships and energy shields protect vessels from damage. So I think these are all the tropes that you would obviously be very familiar with uh, if anyone who's actually watched an episode of Star Trek. You know, all these uh, technologies that, that's currently available uh, within that uh, era of, of science. The United Federation of Planets is surrounded by potentially hostile powers on all sides. In the Alpha Quadrant, the Kardashian Union and the Federation enjoy a tenuous peace as their border is hit by, a, by, a, by militant colonists calling themselves the Marquis. In the Beta Quadrant, the Allied Killing Long Empire is a powerful military civilization spanning hundreds of light years. The Romulan Empire, further toward the center of the galaxy, has been adversary for centuries indeed. So I like this, I like this paragraph in itself because this is not only point. Not only does it, not only do we know what is the world like, we also know what is the what are the threats that are also available in the world, and these are and you know just uh, names like the official quadrant and the beta quadrant may not mean anything right now, except you know I only recall seeing that earlier in the in the, in the advertisement for the box for the for the box set, but it gives an idea of you know where 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 humanity or where the federation is beset from. And you know, uh, obviously, these future names like Kardashian Union, uh, Klingon Empire, obviously, is a very is a more uh, probably is more of the pop the more popular nemesis uh, within the Star Trek universe, other than the Borgs. 
and then there's the Romulan Empire which is also very famous and I actually didn't know that the Romulan Empire is considered a adversary for centuries uh, in in part of the as part of that in part of the Star Trek universe, I thought they were supposed to be some sort of like 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 uh, competitive like com- like like rival allies. So uh, I was really sure that uh, indeed, and the uh, it 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 continues on. So I'm going to skip this sidebar for a moment. What you need to play, but we, it's definitely this is definitely an important sidebar to read afterwards as part of the introductions. Uh, so artwork it looks fine. I don't mind. Uh, yeah, the artwork. I, I'm pretty. I'm pretty happy with the artwork. I think it sort of suits uh, with the Star Trek uh, theme and the sci-fi theme elements of it. And of course, it, it, there is the Kobayashi Maru, which is the most famous test that has been given to Starfleet uh, commanders, I believe, uh, I, of a of a particular kind of dilemma. And it was actually a no-win situation. But I think that's a that's that's an interesting callback. But at the same time. Uh, not significant, I think, to to anyone who's playing the game. <laughs> All right. Indeed, since before the Federation f- was formed, the neutral zone is a buffer between the Federation and the Romulans. And through a wormhole to the Gamma Quadrant, thousands of light years away, the Dominion poses a new threat to everyone in the Alpha Delta Quadrant. So I've never heard, I've never heard of the Dominion before. I don't know who they are. I don't know where do they appear in. Uh, and I'm actually quite interested to know, like, uh, does Star Trek Avengers include some of the more recent uh, iterations of the Star Trek uh, franchise? You know, does does it include? I uh, does it include? I believe it's the Voyager, uh, or does it even include? I think there was another. There's another ongoing series right now. I'm not even, uh, as of 2020. That I'm not sure is it going to be mentioned or being dropped at some point in in, in the Star Trek uh, core rulebook. Or maybe in the future supplements, or and if they are going to expand on the on the newer ones, then what then what came before? All right. So going back to that section about what do you need to play, which is a very important section because you because especially when it comes to like running, especially for me when it comes to running free games, uh, I need to you know prepare the stuff for people to play uh, most of the time, and uh, it's it's also good and and if anyone wants to come in, you know, with their own dice or whatever, they. At least you have a at least you have a reference point to say okay this is exactly what you need to bring or this is exactly what you need to expect to bring uh, for a game of Star Trek Adventures. So twenty sided dice. So D two D twenties are used for resolving tasks and for rolling results on a certain large tables. Often the player will roll two twenty sided dice or two D twenty, which is I guess where the the name of the system came from. But as many as five D twenty can be rolled at once. Now this is something I'm, I wasn't expecting. Two D twenty. But as many as five D twenty can be you rolled at once. So I'm actually, uh, I'm guessing this is supposed to be some sort of like a dice pool based system, uh, but I've never really encountered uh, a dice pool system that uses D twenties as the basis. I think tip, I think the typical one would be D tens and less and lower. But two D twenties uh, in a dice pool system, not only is not only that is there a, a large range within a D twenty system in itself. But to involve more than that just makes the range a lot more bigger. So I'll be very, very curious to see why is it why is it necessary to have you know more than two d twenties, because if the name of the system is two d twenty, you'd be expecting the system to only run on mostly two d twenties. But there are probably very special reasons why they would need to include about three more d twenties. And uh, you know, if you are playing, especially if you're coming from a d d and d tradition, uh. You know, even being able to roll more than two d20s is is quite a unusual thing, uh, even in the fifth edition sense, because at I think fifth edition at most you will only roll two d20s at most at most times, and that and that's on an exceptional basis. So five d20s really really sounds a lot to, for someone who plays only D and D. All right, six sided dice. You need a you need half a dozen or so old fashioned six sided dice, otherwise refer as uh, D6s. So half a dozen means there's six. So you need at least. So I'm guessing here it needs at least six uh, D6s. And I wasn't expecting, uh, you know, a, a system that is called two D20 to use any dice besides two uh, D20s. But then that's not really a fair uh, assumption because you know D and D doesn't only just use one single. D and D doesn't only just use D20s. They use uh, dice for different reasons. So obviously the six-sided dice are used for something else. 
These are used relatively infrequently, meaning to roll on certain small tables. So, uh, so you mentioned there's mention here of small tables, and in, in a D20 system, on a D20 system, they mention things about large, uh, large tables. So I think there's a lot of randomized effects that's in play here. There's a lot of tables involved. Uh, nothing against tables. Uh, I I think they are fine as a as a randomizing effect. Uh, although one of my uh, concerns, especially with a table-based system like say the H system, uh, where they have a stun you know stun tables and all that, is that uh, tables tables are limited in its in in uh, in its application like. Uh, they can only do that many things as much as the tables provided, and it has for me it has that danger of uh, becoming boring. That uh, that it's always the same few options, or same few possible results, and uh, especially when you're doing it in long term play. Uh, so I'll be curious to see what I mean, what these tables look like. Uh, hopefully, they won't be too you know too monotonous in in in, in some ways, uh, and I hope. I hope that you know this system has a way of, of adding variety by using something that's a bit constant. All right. If if multiple six-sided dice are required, it will be noted as x d six, where x is the number of d six required. So two d six shows that two six-sided dice should be rolled. So unlike uh, the two d twenties, which, which can range from two d twenty to five d twenties. I think it, I think it's, it's quite safe to say that you only need half a dozen at most, uh, because they never mention anything. They don't give a specific range of more than more than half a dozen. So, so to so to be on the safe side, bring five d twenties and six d six to a Star Trek Avengers game. All right, tokens. You need some way to keep track of momentum and threat covered later. You need six tokens, beads or chips for momentum. And around a dozen for threats. Now that's actually a really big number. So that's actually quite a lot of things, quite a lot of trinkets that you're gonna need uh, to to play Star Trek Avengers. Uh, six tokens for for momentum and half a, and around a dozen for threat. That's so that's six and twelve. Uh, especially for me, I'm not I'm I I you know for myself speaking as someone who plays a lot of D and D. Uh, tokens aren't exactly a thing that we uh, we carry a lot. We carry around a lot. Uh, I'm not sure if this can be substituted with a dice. So, for example, like uh, if he needs six tokens for moment for for momentum, uh, can that be substituted with a d6 in the sense that we're just using the d6 to track uh, how many, how much momentum that we have or we have used up or what in some point? I mean, in other, I mean that's as a substitute or alternative if we don't have tokens as that many tokens. I don't even think I have that many tokens because. The only times I use tokens in D and D is for inspiration, and even that by raw, you only give about one token per person at most. Uh, you know, that's just uh, rules as written, uh, and that's. I think I can. I'll be measure. I'll be ma able to scrunch up six tokens. I can just use anything, but a dozen a dozen for track is quite a challenge, and a dozen here means twelve. So, again, I I will be interested to see if this if possible to use a d20 a d12 to track threats rather than using 12 uh, track tokens in, in, instead uh, yeah so I'll be keeping an eye on that and and I'll be interested I'll be interested to read more about this threat and momentum system that, that comes with it and hopefully it has some way tied with the d6 and the d20 all right paper pen pencil is try for making notes of traits or making maps making maps uh, interesting because I wasn't expect. Uh, well, I mean, understandably, Star Trek is a game of exploration, so there's going to be a lot of maps involved. But I wasn't expecting, uh, you know, maps to be created on the spot, on the fly, on the table. I was expecting. I I would be expecting. Uh, I was expecting a GM to be providing the map at some point, and then the pl the play. It's more about the players uncovering the map rather than. Uh, drawing their own map, so it'll be interesting to see exactly when is it necessary for players to draw maps on the table. I mean, and this is not, I mean, unless it's unless it's some sort of like dungeon crawly way of doing it. But this is a this is a this is a Star Trek game. You don't draw dungeons on the map. You're drawing s s entire sections of space. So it'll be interesting to see uh, when maps would be needed to be created on the fly. All right, so continuing on. Starfleet needs a crew. Star Trek Avengers 
it's a role playing game using the two using the two D twenty system. So now I think we're getting into the stuff about talking about uh, design intentions, some expectations, and what the game is really about, as compared to what are the rules that what what are the rules that have been provided to make the game that you want. Uh, this quick guide summarizes the, the summarizes rules for the game of discovery and adversity on eating worlds and beyond the stuff. So, I. I may be taking this. I may be taking things too literal, but this is a very important sentence to me at times. It's a game of discovery and adversity on alien worlds and beyond the star. It's the key word probably here would be adversity, discovery and adversity. This is what the game is about. It's about discovery and adversity, and obviously set on alien worlds and beyond the star. So I guess you know, uh, as a as a this is this is in this is useful. Uh, sentence guidelines for GMs like if when I'm thinking about running a Star, a Star Trek adventure what are the themes that I'm trying to do it's about discovery and adversity on alien worlds that's basically the guiding principle I, I know this is a very literal take on it but I think this is a very good if, if it's not if it's not about the if it's not about this uh, you know specifically at least it's a good starting point to go with like uh, to, to and this is where the direction of your idea should be headed towards and what is what what in the mind what in the mind of the designers or at least in the mind in based on this book of Star Trek Adventures, it's this is what the game is sort of built towards and built to cater for. Uh, and you know, uh, I mean, there's nothing stopping you from running a a full blown mass combat in space sort of a, a adventure in with Star Trek Adventures. But I think what you're gonna find most likely within the book that it's 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 exploring the idea of discovery and adversity on, on alien worlds and that's sort of the mindset you had to go into in, when you're reading the rest of the rules uh, you know whether it's a quick start or possibly uh, and possibly if this line is repeated in the core rule book that is the mindset you have to go reading into the rules about about the game all right you should read these rules before running the sample mission in the second part of, the, of this booklet which is probably which is there included the mission itself introduces key concepts as you play through the encounter, now this is actually a very this is actually a very interesting sentence because, uh, in my experiences with some quick starts, especially from when I was running a bunch of quick starts from last year, uh, there were many many a times where, what well, the adventure that was provided uh, in the quick start doesn't really tally or doesn't really is not really catered with the quick start routine itself. They are either uh, elements that were not used at all. Uh, you know, in the quick start, uh, and, and I mean, there were elements that were, that were completely not used from the quick start at all in, inside the adventure, or there were times where the adventures uh, required some sort of uh, uh, advanced understanding of that particular rule set that was not provided within the quick start in itself. So, uh, this is definitely one of my biggest complaints and one of my biggest critiques about quick start rules is that always make sure that your the adventures that you are tied with the quick start. It's always built with, built with an understanding from the quick start, not from the main route in itself. Uh, and it's actually quite frustrating to see that I've, when, you, when you make an effort to understand a particular rule, and you never see that rule put into practice and into application in the quick start adventure in itself. Because then, then it's number one, it's confusing because you're not exactly sure did you not did you not use the rule properly, or number and number two is you have this conception that you have this perception that maybe this rule is not. It, uh, a big deal in the main game in itself and then when you only only later on when you only for you to realize that actually you you may have actually missed out a very important rule in the main game in itself so for this book for this adventure to claim that uh, the mission itself introduces key content as you play through the encounter uh, gives me a little bit of hope that uh, the designers for this quick start actually has put some thought into trying to tie the quick start rules together with the adventure with the mission with the adventure that comes with it and that is definitely something that i will be much i'll, I'll be really really happy and really, really glad that if they do so all right the next section introduces all the rules needed to play this mission beginning with the description of how staff the officers are constructed and how tasks are resolved so i'm guessing uh description of staff the officers are constructed is under the character rules and then the task rules you know by its entire section all right challenge dice all right so um, we are introducing i guess we are going into areas. We are being we are, be, we are being introduced to the uh, some of the core mechanics. 
The third type of dice used are challenge dice, denoted in Star Trek Avengers by this symbol. So, okay, so we're going to have to pay attention. So, every time we see this symbol, we see challenge dice. Six sided dice are used primarily for inflicting damage and determining how much protection a character receives from cover. Inflicting damage and determining how much protection is from cover. Each, each challenge dice has four faces with three possible results. Score of one. So I'm guessing this challenge dice ties back with the part about using D6s. So that sort of gives an idea that the D20s are for task related. Uh, checks and the, uh, the D6s are for uh, conflict related checks or threats. Alright, coming back again. So each has four faces, a score of one, <coughs> a score of two, two faces showing the stuff in insignia, which is an effect, and two blank faces for no result. So this, <coughs> so just by that, uh, we are looking at special specialty dice. Uh, it's not my favorite thing for a rule system to have specialty dice, especially when it's only specifically tied to the system. But I've all, I'm I'm definitely more forgiving to for a system who allows you to have some sort of alternative to read results uh, with existing dice rather than using a specialty dice. I'm definitely not so forgiving if, uh, if I'm required to use a specialty dice that I cannot be, I, I cannot substitute with any, anything else. A group of challenge dice is usually rolled all at once and the results added together. Multiple challenge dice are noted as X challenge dice where X is the number of challenge dice rolled. So four, X, four challenge dice indicates four challenge dice should be rolled and their results added together. So I'm, so, I'm not sure if there's a difference between rolling challenge dice compared with, say, rolling uh, D6s. There may, be a, there may be a difference here. But obviously, I guess the, the easiest way, you, you still have to separate the idea that these, uh, rolling XD6 means you have to read the results as a D6, whereas when rolling for four challenge dice, you have to read the results as four challenge dice, which has three different, which, which has three possible results. Alright, if you don't have special challenge dice available, you can use normal D6 dice instead. Thank you. Treat any dice which rolls a 3 or 4 as blank and any die which rolls a 5 as an effect. So we have, this is our, so the challenge dice result table is, this is our, this is our, our alternative uh, way of reading uh, the D6 as, challenge, as a challenge dice. So I'm definitely a very, very grateful for this to be, to be made available uh not only in the quick start because if if this was not included in the quick start then i would i, I would pretty much drop the game in, in, in right here right now because i don't have if i i'm not told that i can use uh a d6 as a substitute and i have to get i have to get my hands on this specialty dice then i you know that's just that's just an adi additional barrier to getting into the game that i have to buy the specialty dice before i can even even run uh, the quick start so this is much appreciated. I really, really, I'll, I want to make, I want to, everyone to take note that this is a much appreciated thing to have in a quick start adventure. All right, so a one is one, a two is a two, a three or four is a zero, right, which, I, which I'm assuming is the blank face. Uh, I'm guessing this is taking some inspirations from maybe say fate, but I'm not, I, I, won't, I, I mean, I don't want to, I'm not really familiar with fate with myself, and this is definitely one of the systems that I'm be, I'll be interested in doing an RPG study hour for, but let's just move on and get on with that. So 5 and 6 is 1 plus effect, and 5 and 6 is the same effect, so it's not. So uh, it'll be interesting to know what is the meaning of 1 and 2, uh, and also we have to take note that the results are added together when they're multiple. So let's say if I roll 4, four challenge dice, uh, I think that's an example here, yep, example. Uh, Lieutenant Commander Delta hides a bomb drone with a blast from his phaser, and roll six challenge dice for the damage. He rolls a one, two, and an effect, and three blank faces for a total of score of four. So he can activate an effect. So one, two is because he rolled a one and a two, and then he rolled an effect which is only a one plus. So it's actually one plus two plus one. That's how you get, and that's how he gets a four and an effect. All right, moving on to the next page. So I think oh, oh okay. So that's that's pretty much it. That's pretty much the introduction page, Introdu introduction section of. Uh, Star Trek Avengers, right? 
not a bad not a bad introduction uh because first of all uh the first page gives a very good i would say summary of what the what of the what the world is of the setting and what is what is the current state of it that it's at uh it gives it gives you an, it gives you a breakdown of what you need exactly so the important takeaways here are obviously the 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 inside dice the six sided dice the tokens uh although i i guess it would have made things a bit better if they clarified what the six sided dice are for if they're only exclusively used as challenge dice uh and they, i mean they do have, they, could have, they could have just mentioned that uh, these these sixes are, are called challenge dice or something like that and then explain what exactly a challenge dice is for uh, or what a challenge dice is in its own in its own section but uh Challenge dice is obviously going to be a new thing to me. Uh, I've never, uh, I don't think I really use a real system that actually made this an explicit, you know, an explicit subsystem of reading dice. Uh, the in the zero engine, the only, uh, the most important numbers were only one and six, and everything else in between really doesn't matter. So, uh, challenge dice is definitely a, a a a mechanic that I, I you know. I'll be interested to see further and see how it's actually being used and why is it why is it so important to have a different way of reading dice as compared to your normal uh, one to six method. Uh, and there's a, there there are some great assumptions. I mean, there are some important assumptions that have already been made. That uh, who who do you play as? Uh, as a staff, that you are among the best and finest, and you and you are part of a crew. I don't think they specifically mentioned. Uh, but yes, then then is I've already got an idea of a theme of the game. The game is about discovery, as I said, Dis uh, discovery of discovery of the alien worlds, uh, and also some instructions on what you should do first before you actually run the game. Uh, yeah. So I guess that's 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 pretty much it. That's a, that's a very good. Uh, I think it's a pretty good start to the Star Trek quick uh, Star Trek Adventures quick start. And you know, all my thoughts are already poured, uh, given as I'm reading through them. Uh, and hopefully, I'll be back with next week for the next video that we can start going into the main rules of the set, the main rule section of the of the quick start itself, which will be starting at basic operations. So this is the questing GM signing out for now, and I hope you give your feedback on what you think about this uh, series of videos. Uh, if you'd like to see more of them. Uh, or, or any ideas of what you what would you like to know more about uh, in these uh, videos and hopefully I can make them and you'll be not only useful for myself but also be useful to you. So this is the Questing GM signing up for now and I'll see you in the next one. Good night.